community and welcome back to our video series. I am so pleased to have Dr. Margot Anderson again here. This is her second appearance, so it's always nice to have her here to educate us. Um, we are going to be talking about the mystical thyroid today. I've gotten a lot of questions about this in the last couple of weeks. And, you know, to be honest, I'd like some education as well. So Dr. Anderson is here to talk with us. And I just want to preface this video by saying this is for educational purposes, this conversation that we're having and the questions that we're, we're um, going back and forth with. So um, in reality, if you have questions about your specific case and your specific healthcare, care, um, please reach out to your provider that manages your care. Um, but again, this is for educational purposes. So we are all here to learn something, which is pretty exciting. So some of you know Dr. Um, Anderson, but I'm just going to give you a quick bio for the people who are watching for the first time. Um, Dr. Anderson is a board-certified family medicine physician who is currently providing direct primary care near New Orleans, Louisiana. As a direct primary care physician, she works with patients in person and via telehealth in an intimate way that allows for an ongoing relationship, providing meaningful and individualized care solutions. She has a particular passion for caring for women with a focus on hormones and fertility and is a certified NAPRO medical consultant. So again, Dr. Anderson, thanks again for letting us pick your brain. What a privilege. <laughs> okay. Thank you so, for the introduction, Sarah. It's so nice to be speaking with you again. Yes, absolutely. This is always like a highlight of my month. So I'm excited. <laughs> Um, Dr. Anderson, the first thing I want to ask is um, the thyroid is a mystical gland for some women. We hear about hypothyroid or hyperthyroid, but the whole system is quite complicated. Can you explain what thyroid hormones are responsible for in simple terms? And yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> so the thyroid gland, um, I sent you a little picture just so some people do better with visuals. It's a gland in your neck, it sits just above your collarbone and it's part of your endocrine system, which means that that gland makes hormones. And in this case, thyroid hormones, there are two main types of thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. And um, the thyroid hormones have an effect really on almost every organ system. So they have, we can say whole body effects which is why it's so important to make sure this gland is working optimally. Um, and this makes sense when you look at the symptoms that can occur when the thyroid is off. So the other, I sent you a picture that has um, sort of the hyper and the hypothyroidism side by side. If you can pull that one up. Yes, I'm gonna do my little toggle. Here we go. Can you see that? I don't see it. I don't <laughs> try it one more time. Okay, I saw it for a brief second. Okay, I think it's up for our viewers here. Okay, so if, if you can see this picture, you'll see there's mm -hmm. a right on the left side that has hyper and hypo. So if the thyroid gland is um, overactive, you're considered hyperthyroid. And if it's underactive, you're considered hypothyroid. And um, this picture you'll see commonly in you know, medical textbooks and things. And, and so if you're looking over these symptoms and some of these kind of sound like you, it would be worth looking into is something going on with my thyroid. Mm -hmm. So kind of speaking to that, obviously you kind of have showed some of those hallmark symptoms, um, but how do both hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism affect our cycles and our reproductive health? This is kind of the kicker question when it comes to charting, right? Especially women who have pre-existing thyroid issues. Yes. So if you were paying really close attention to that graphic and <laughs> you might've seen on both sides that infertility was listed, hyper and hypo. Um, and both of those conditions can contribute to infertility and miscarriage. Um, and someone that has infertility and miscarriage is, you know, gonna have something going on with their cycle. Um, for any woman that comes to me, you know, she's charting, she's noticing there's some abnormalities. Um, right away, part of my initial evaluation does include thyroid labs. Um, and then, you know, looking specifically at the chart without even doing labs or any, you know, specific workup when we're just looking at the chart, 
we don't always like see very obvious clear signs sometimes it can be you know we don't see it on the chart at all but if we do see something what's typical is for someone that's hyperthyroid so their thyroid is overactive they typically have shorter lighter periods and then um, someone with hypothyroidism so their thyroid's underactive have longer heavier heavier periods um, that's typical but it's it's not always the rule mm -hmm. Um, I think you and I, maybe at some point in our life, it sounds like when we were first discussing, have fallen into that category of feeling like your thyroid labs are normal. That's what you get told, you know, um, but you might not feel well, you know, and you might exhibit some hypothyroid symptoms. So is it possible to have thyroid issues that are what we would call subclinical? Yeah, so oftentimes when you go to your primary care doctor, your OBGYN, and you want to check your thyroid, um, they'll just check one lab, the TSH value. It stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, some of them will check a free T4, um, but it's, it's really rare for them to check a full thyroid panel. And um, most physicians that are in the realm of restorative reproductive medicine and, and focusing on things the way that I do, um, they're checking a few more labs than just the TSH. Um, so we get a better overall picture of how the thyroid is functioning. Um, whenever we check those labs, it's a snapshot in time. It's what was going on that second your blood was drawn. There is some fluctuation throughout the day. Um, and so it, it can be tricky, you know, but you have to correlate the labs with the person in front of you. So we're doing both as part of our evaluation. We're, um, you know, talking about their symptoms and if they have enough symptoms that go along with the potential thyroid problem, plus the labs, we look at both of those together. Um, and then, you know, one thing that's also tricky about diagnosing thyroid disease is the symptoms are not incredibly specific. Like someone that is hypothyroid, um, some of those symptoms are like being depressed, tired all the time, having trouble losing weight. Um, but you can easily blame those on other things and they could be due to other things. Like maybe that person is really stressed out um, every day. Maybe they're not getting enough sleep. Maybe they work night shift, maybe, um, their diet, you know, isn't up to par. So once again, we're, we're looking at the thyroid, we're looking at those lab numbers, but we're looking at the person and taking into account everything um, as, as part of our treatment. Mm -hmm. And what would treatment um, with a restorative approach kind of look like? Um, is it multimodal in that, uh, that approach? Obviously, you're kind of looking at different angles of looking at the thyroid. So I would have uh, assume that the um, treatment might be from looking from multiple angles as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, you're looking at the individual patient in front of you. I mm -hmm. always with everyone, you kind of, you do need to start with the basics. Are you getting adequate sleep? Are mm -hmm. you having a diet that is nutrient rich and um, doesn't have tons of sugar and processed foods or fast foods? Um, are you getting some sort of daily movement exercise in your day? And then when we want to get a little more specific about thyroid, there are some things to consider. There are a few um, minerals in particular that are important for the thyroid. Um, iodine, zinc, selenium, iron are uh, you know, some of the higher of ones of concern that I look at. Um, you have to be careful. You, I don't recommend anybody just start taking tons of supplements at high doses, you know, um, work with your doctor on sort of evaluating, are you getting adequate levels of these nutrients? And there are some blood tests for some of them. Um, and then another thing to really consider if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So Hashimoto's is when you specifically have elevated thyroid antibodies and it's an autoimmune disease. Gluten is a big um, thing to be aware of with that. You it can potentially be a trigger for Hashimoto's. And so um, anybody that's having a thyroid issue, um, I often recommend at least a trial off of gluten to see if that improves their symptoms or their lab values and just kind of their overall well-being. Another factor to pay very close attention to is your stress levels. Um, if you've heard about cortisol, that's your stress hormone. When cortisol is too high, 
it can actually um, mess with the effect of thyroid hormone. And so, you know, you could be doing all these things to try to fix your thyroid, but if your cortisol levels are too high, your thyroid's not going to be working right. Mm -hmm. So that's something to consider. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was endocrine disruptors. So what's that? Um, these are chemical compounds that um, mess with your endocrine system and they are found all over the place. <laughs> um, particularly, it's important to pay attention to plastics. So water bottles, food containers, you know, um, never like a lot of people like those microwave meals and they, they often come in plastic containers. When you microwave that meal, um, those endocrine disrupting chemicals that are in the plastic, are they're getting into your food and you're eating that. Um, also pay close attention to your personal care products, the shampoo, perfume, lotions. They depend, you know, there's a lot of really good brands out there now that are making it a lot easier to get clean products. And so you, you really have to be a detective about what am I putting in my body and what are these chemicals and are they safe for me or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting because um, one of the questions I was going to ask you is, are there natural ways to promote thyroid health? And you really just hit it on the head, right? Is like looking at your lifestyle, my diet, um, looking at, you said, the environment around you, looking at your sleep hygiene. I think sleep hygiene is really, really hard for people who are in their midlife, right? Especially with kids and busy jobs and all of that. It's, it's, I almost feel bad sometimes when I say, hey, you got to do this, this, and this to improve your health. And it's the simple things. It just feels really hard, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, um, it's not, it's, it's not anything glamorous. It's just yeah. you know, those basic <laughs> self-care things. And, and yeah. And then, you know, the final thing I didn't mention is actual medication, you know, and then mm -hmm. and there's a few different thyroid medicines we do use um, depending on the person's situations and how their labs look. And, mm -hmm. and that's part of the picture too. And how closely should somebody who's on medications for thyroid be followed? Um, you know, I, I've talked with women too, who might've been prescribed a Synthroid, you know, a thyroid medication, like, you know, a year ago and they haven't seen anybody. And so I'm just curious, you know, from your standpoint, how closely should that patient be followed? Yeah. So when I first, um, if I'm starting someone on a medicine, it's brand new to them. I will recheck levels in four to six weeks mm -hmm. while we're figuring out their dose, it should be rechecked that often it can't you know we kind of have to give it time to um, start working your body so you can't check it sooner than that but mm -hmm. at least you know within about six weeks you recheck the levels and you may be you know sometimes we get it right on the first try and we've got you on a good dose so um we you know when we figure out what your dose is you can space that out some mm -hmm. so that you're not absolutely having to get labs every six weeks mm -hmm. um you know some people that have been on the same dose for years and their level is always good. When they check their labs, they might do it every six months, but it, it kind of depends on your individual situation. Um, and then if you notice a change, you know, if your symptoms are changing or something in your life is changing, I think, um, you know, maybe you have a job change, maybe you have go through a pregnancy, you know, um, that has potential to affect your thyroid. So if you notice something feels off, you know, recheck it, but, but yeah, mm -hmm. so it, it kind of depends. <laughs> yeah. So obviously working with a doctor closely on that is right. probably a plus, <laughs> not <laughs> shopping around too much for different doctors to um, work with your thyroid. Um, specifically, how does pregnancy and breastfeeding affect our thyroid? Um, Cause I know, you know, for women who have had babies or have been pregnant, um, obviously that first year after a baby is just like a whirlwind, you're exhausted already, but how do those specific points in our reproductive life affect our thyroid health? Yeah. So, um, having a healthy thyroid is incredibly important to achieving and maintaining a healthy pregnancy. So that's another reason why, you know, you should be looking at that even before you get pregnant. Um, one thing to know as well as in that first trimester of pregnancy, your baby is completely dependent on you for their thyroid hormone. So the baby, because their, their thyroid isn't formed yet. So you having good thyroid levels means that your baby will have good thyroid levels and that's important for the baby's development and their brain and kind of nervous system growth. Um, 
during actually during the first trimester of pregnancy, we often see that women, um, their thyroid hormone levels increase slightly and some people even get a little hyper thyroid. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, makes sense because your baby needs a little more thyroid hormone at that point in time. Um, it's also one of the reasons why um, it's recommended in a prenatal vitamin to have at least 150 micrograms of iodine. Um, iodine is one of those um, minerals I mentioned earlier that's so important for thyroid health. And, um, and then after pregnancy in the postpartum period, this is like you said, kind of a, a crazy time. It's, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's, you know, if it's your first baby, that's the huge learning curve. If it's yeah. your second or, you know, it doesn't matter. It, um, there's so many changes that occur right away in, in all your hormones after delivery in that postpartum period. Um, it's generally a time where there is lack of sleep um, and increased stress. So a lot of women, they don't really know what's normal and what's not normal. They're like, maybe I'm supposed to feel this way. Maybe this is normal for postpartum or, you know, is this really excessive? Am, am, I, am I probably way more fatigued than I really should be or something like that? So if you're in the postpartum period and you are having those feelings, really, you just go, go see your doctor, go get checked out. You know, that, that would be my advice at that point, because it is definitely possible to have a thyroid issue. And also that can change as you get further out. So like within the first three months postpartum, there's a lot of changes, but maybe six months out to a year later, you know, maybe, maybe you need some thyroid hormone at some point, but then six months later, your stress isn't as bad, you're sleeping more, um, you know, maybe your thyroid improves some and you don't need medicate, you know, so it's, it's mm -hmm. one of those things where you, if you're feeling like something's off, well, look into it, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, another thing I'll mention about the postpartum period, if you are one of those people that, um, have elevated thyroid antibodies, like, like someone with Hashimoto's, um, I have some patients that have elevated antibodies, but they don't, their thyroid function is not off. So they're starting to show some signs of an autoimmune process going on, but it hasn't gotten bad enough to where it's made like their actual thyroid mm -hmm. hormones off. Um, but commonly, or I don't know commonly, but you'll see those patients in the postpartum period. Mm -hmm. That's the point at which their thyroid hormones start to be off. So they had that sort of predisposition because they have these elevated thyroid antibodies and then they get to their postpartum period, things are going a little crazy. And at that point, their thyroid starts to be off so that then they'll have more significant symptoms. Mm -hmm. Oh man, it's amazing our womanly bodies, aren't they? Like just, <laughs> I mean, the changes we go through throughout our reproductive life are just blows my mind, you know, and how adaptable right. our bodies are. But I guess, you know, just, to recap some of this is like, it's okay to ask for help, you know, like we can't be a hundred percent on our game all the time. And if something doesn't feel right, it's worth investigating, um, especially if it's not your baseline, right? Would you recommend um, just generally uh, that for women who kind of are suspecting that, you know, something's a little bit off for them. I often tell the people I work with to keep a little journal of, you know, how you're feeling, how much you're sleeping, that kind of stuff. So almost as a log, because it's really easy just to forget two days ago. Like I can't even remember what we had for dinner last night, right? <laughs> so I almost think keeping a log is a good way to kind of like keep tabs on yourself. Um, is that a recommendation that you would um, tell people who are suspecting? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it does, because in another reason that would be a good thing is because a lot of times you, when you get into the doctor's office. Um, your mind goes blank, you know, for, in some <laughs> cases, it's like you have all these things, you know, you wanted to say, and then you forget. So that's another reason why doing that would be good. Yeah. And, and that's part of why the charting is so important is because there's no, it's not like you get into the doctor's office and you're like, yeah, I think this is when my period was. And I think this is, you know, you have a chart and there's no questions, you know, we just, mm -hmm. there it is. And it's something that you've observed day by day. And the yep. same thing, you know, we do that often for um, patients that suffer from chronic headaches or migraines, you know, we ask them mm -hmm. to keep a, a migraine diary and, and because you think you're going to remember and then you don't. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Having that information is, yeah. is helpful. 
I also tell people, the women I work with, that your chart, I, I stole this from a friend, so I can't take um, full credit for it. But, you know, if you were going to do a thousand piece puzzle, you would never start in the middle because that would just drive you insane. And so you start on the outside and you build the border. And that's kind of how I describe charting, right? Your health is this big puzzle, but we start on the outside. We'll put those charting pieces together and then we'll work on the rest of the inside picture, right? With tests and labs and all that other stuff. But I think that's where the utility of charting really comes in handy when you're looking at all kinds of different things that can be off with hormones in our body. Um, right, so obviously yeah, that's yeah. my plug for charting because I have, to, <laughs> I have to have one plug for charting, right? <laughs> um, well, I really appreciate your time. Um, I want to make this video a snippet so that women will watch the whole thing because there's so many uh, gold mines in here to, um, to comb through. So is there any last resources that you would suggest women if they want to um, learn more about this um, or about their thyroid in general? Any trusted sources that you would point them to? And if you can't think of one off the top of your head, we can always link it into the video also later. So yeah, let me let me do that. I'll send you some links because yeah. there there are some good good ones out there. There's so much on the internet, but <laughs> you know, yeah, you have to kind of read through it. Yeah, I know. And it's really nice to, yeah, like to get some trusted resources because Dr. Google is quite the whole, so it can get a little yes. crazy. Um, well, again, I really appreciate your time. And for all the women who get the pleasure of watching this, just remember this for educational purposes. Um, these get posted in our True Femme Facebook community and on our YouTube channel. Um, but you can follow Dr. Margot on her blog and remind us the name or uh, the website. <laughs> um, DrMargoAnderson.com. I think you told me that last time, but I was like, that it's, was so simple. Yeah, it's, it's simple. <laughs> and then what's your Instagram? Margo Anderson, MD. I think yeah. it is. Yeah, <laughs> so look for her. Um, follow her on Instagram. She's a, She has a cool blog and you can find some great information on there as well. So again, thanks again for being here, Dr. Margo Anderson. And we will look forward to having you again about all these burning topics that women want to know about. Thank you. It was great talking with you. Yeah, we'll see you next time.